Hello and welcome back to the Boxing Social Podcast in association with Betfred. With me, your host, Rob Tebbett. Delighted to be joined today. It's been a while, but I'm joined today by unbeaten cruiserweight contender now, I guess. You're not a prospect anymore. Contender, yeah. Yeah. Richard <laughs> Reakpo. How are you, Rich? I'm good. How are you doing? It's I'm been a good. While. It has been a while. Yeah, it has such been a, a while. long time. Um, as people will, will kind of find out throughout the course of this interview, we do go back a fair bit. I've known you since you were known as El Chocolato all of those years ago. <laughs> um, Chocolato. Chocolato. Chocolate um, in Italian. <laughs> yeah, the, the Italian chocolate. First of all, how did you come up with that original nickname and why did you get rid of it? <laughs> it's funny because um, I had a lot of Italian friends at the time and I just thought, chocolate, yeah, I like that name, chocolate. But we're not, you know, we need to do something different. Um, my friends are Italian, so what's chocolate in Italian? And then it was Chocolato. I could I just learn how to pronounce it? And it, the way it, it was spelt was quite weird. But I thought, you know what, this is different. Let me try this. And um, yeah, just ran with it. And after after a while, everybody just kind of tried to pronounce it in a certain way. But they used to, you know, call me. It it, it ran it ran for a while. To be fair, why did you get Even, rid of it? I just wanted it to be a bit more uniform across the board. A lot of people had difficulty with pronouncing it as well, so I just took it off. And even though I changed the name, everybody still can like try to. They kept on calling me Chocolate, Chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> I liked yeah. it. I remember you introduced. I remember one of the, as I say, we we go back a few years now. I remember being introduced to you at the time, and I was saying Richard Riappo, and then I said, "Tell him the nickname, Rich, yeah, Il Chocolato." And you had like, <laughs> like when Marvin Hagler moved to Italy, and he started pronouncing <laughs> words with an Italian accent. Yeah, it was it was so really nice. nice one to hear. But yes, thanks very much for coming down today. Yeah. Um, it's no been problem. a while since we've actually done an interview. It's probably a couple of years now. Yeah, it's since been such a while. But I've been on your platform, you know. In you between. have. You've been doing but, bits and pieces yeah. with, with Andy and Ryan yeah. and, and things like that, but we've not caught up. I think the last time I saw you, I saw you in Vegas when you had your hand in a cast. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Um, but we never... Wilder. Got, yeah. Wilder 2. Wilder Fury 2, which feels... Yeah. How long ago does that feel? It feels like a long, long time ago. But it was only last year. Just, um, 12, 13 months ago. Mm. World changed a lot since then. Oh, man. How have you handled things? You're quite a chilled guy, generally speaking, like from, from knowing you for a while. And I feel like you probably use the time to do something quite interesting. That's usually the sort of thing that you do. You don't, not really a sit around and do nothing type guy. Well, I've been, well, let me think, let me think back. I remember when we first got into, we came into lockdown, I was just training outdoors. I still had the cast on. So I was doing what I could, you know, um, what well, else? Started studying the stock market. Started looking to cryptos. Looking for the next flipping stock that's gonna take that's gonna take off to the moon or Mars. And been training, just studying the boxing, studying the boxing, and planning my next moves. That's all I've been doing. What is it? What what led you to the stock market and crypto? That's that's not. You're you're always full of surprises, but you know. <laughs> but what what led you to that? You know what? To be fair. Everybody was talking about the stocks and, you know, they said this is at all time low and everything is pretty much on sale. So you want to get in there now because when things, you know, get back to normality, everything is going to shoot back up. So I thought, OK, let me just look into this. And I had to do my due diligence, of course, before I invested. And I spent a lot of time doing that. But it's pretty okay. interesting. Any tips? <laughs> as, soon, you must, as soon as you mentioned that you must it's have it's funny because there's you know it's there were so many opportunities to get in there like like now if you got in there back then when everything crashed like this last year this time oh my gosh like you would have been laughing your head off if you got in there with the right things like we're talking about amazon i remember when it crashed it was probably about 17 1600 dollars 1800 dollars i see it grow you know i saw it grow over time, I think now it's over 3k. So Tesla, Tesla, like pretty much nothing. The cryptos, they were pretty much nothing. Some of them, um, cryptos, um, 1000 X. So you can imagine if you put, you know, a little bit of money there, it would have been ridiculous today. Even Bitcoin, you know, Bitcoin went up ridiculous amount. So yeah, it's interesting following it. 
Could you imagine yourself all of those years ago being in one position to talk about stocks and crypto? No, and <laughs> <laughs> I promise you never, but I really did wish I studied that in uni instead. Uh, sure. We're going to go back and talk about kind of your, your origins and not just sport, but life. And you, I know you've had a very interesting backstory um, that we'll all cover. But um, talk to us about your studying. Um, you, you've, you're one of the kind of the growing number of, of boxers who, you know, done further education and, and gone to try and kind of challenge yourself in other ways within yeah. within your life. You're not just kind of, I mean, obviously the life of a boxer means you have to really commit to boxing anyway, but you've always left space for you to do other things and pursue other academic goals. Talk to us about those. Yeah, I think I kind of like one of the few fighters out here that changed the perception of boxers. Every time I speak to somebody about boxers, they would always assume that they're not intelligent, but they can fight. You know, maybe slow when they speak, not articulate, but they can fight. And when I tell people I've got a degree, they're always shocked. And they could probably tell with the way I speak and stuff that, you know, I'm educated to a certain degree. Um, but, you know, it's good to see, like, there's there's actually a lot of fighters that's, that's um, you know, gone to do further education, mm. higher education. John Fisher was one of them. He's actually um, educated to a master's yeah. um, level, which was impressive. And who else? Joshua, Joshua Bwatsi. Yeah. Joshua Bwatsi, degree. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's good. You know, changing the whole flipping perception, the whole narrative. And, and it's good because, you know, the young athletes that are coming in in the game, they're looking at us and seeing what we achieved. And it just shows that you can actually do do that you can go and get your degree and then go turn pro and still achieve in the pro ranks look at look at where joshua watsi is look where i am look at where um john fisher is he's doing his thing and he's he's got a big platform and he's working so it's anything is possible you know umar sadiq it's all possible. umar sadiq i think L- like umar sadiq yeah i like him as well another Very nigerian good. man yeah Nigerians are taking over. <laughs> they are <laughs> taking over. They are taking over. Um, we'll, we'll talk about uh, all things Nigeria um, in a little bit. But of course, you haven't always been this um, this very polite, charming, intelligent. Yeah. I'm not, not saying oh, intelligent. You. You've Thank always you. been intelligent. It. But like, <laughs> um, man that we sit in fr- see sitting in front of us now. Actually, ironically, one of our editorial team at Boxing Social, who we inherited from Boxing Monthly last year, a certain Luke Williams... Used to oh, be your my, school teacher. That's my main man. Once upon a that's time, man, he yeah. was your school teacher. He now writes for Boxing Social, one of the very, very best boxing writers out there, not just in British boxing, but around the world. He's fantastic. Um, anybody who's watching this, I'm sure you would have read his work. And if you haven't, please go on to boxing-social.com and check it out. Yeah. Now I'm done with the plug. Um, <laughs> tell us about school. And, and I guess he would have been Mr. Williams back yeah, then. Yeah, Mr. Williams. We used to give him hell. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Williams, shout out to Luke Williams. Shout out to Mr. Lantico as well. Carnegie, everybody, Mr. Seafire. You know, they helped to like really grow, like um, just kind of nurture us and school us about the, the life, like life after school, mm. you know, which is um, a shock to us when we left. We used to always get babied and pampered. So Luke Williams was my drama teacher. He later on became an um, English teacher. But we, he said he used to have nightmares and he used to dread coming into school to, to take our class because we used to be like maniacs in there. We used to just do our own thing, cause so much trouble. It was our getaway. Drama class was the getaway from everything else. But we was good. We was good at drama. Oh, and and yeah, um, I think after I left, I was doing a boxing. I was boxing on small horse shows, just trying to build my name. And I got a message from Luke Williams and he said that he's, uh, he does, you know, he's wrote, wrote a book on boxing uh, on a certain boxer and he's a boxing historian. I could not believe it that he wants to write, you know, you know, a feature of me in a boxing monthly magazine, a magazine that I grew up just like going into like WH Smith just to, just to read and have a look at. And I couldn't believe it. I was shocked. He did me a proper four page spread i was completely unknown but he kind of bring my name to light and start talking about me you know building up fights in in the in his work and talking about me fighting like robin dupree and stuff i'll never forget and it was a it was a, an amazing feeling you know just to get that support from from him 
back then then he actually came to my fights he bring uh he did a trip with the school and they put they sold a lot of tickets for me and they bring you know a lot of the um, students from the school and they had chance for me and everything <laughs> trust me good memories man good memories and yeah they've been following my journey ever since That's and i think it's amazing how you know they see me boxing on small horse shows just trying to build up a, a little name for me and hoping that i get you know into the on the big platforms and then get on the big platforms and actually win titles and and win the british title as well and actually every time i won a title i bring it back to the school just to show them it's it's like it's been unbelievable for them to just watch and follow so you know we're looking to do way more than that as well this is just the beginning in my eyes but yeah it's it's amazing to have that support from from people like that it's such a small world isn't it <sighs> it's like, crazy i couldn't believe it because as i mentioned i keep harping on about it but I knew for several years and, and obviously he's come over and worked with us and it was kind of like hang on how did how did this happen um, so weird do you feel bad now about being a little shit at school to be honest i wasn't really i wasn't you really strike like me that. you strike me as like somebody who could potentially be lured in by the wrong crowd yeah we say? definitely yeah. i was influenced i was definitely influenced you blame everybody else which yeah, is all right it wasn't my fault <laughs> <laughs> no but no honestly i was i would describe myself as um I was quiet, but I was I was always up to something, you know. I knew what was going on. Um, could come across conniving at some time, at times, and yeah, just observant. So yeah. What was it? Um, what was it like growing up in London? Where were you? Where did you grow up in London? Woolworth, Peckham, mm. Brixton. Interesting South. place to grow up. South East boy. Mm. What was that like? Tough, very tough. Let me tell you a story. I remember I used to go out. Back in the days, there was a period of time where robbing somebody's trainers was okay. Robbing your jacket was okay. So, you know, back then when we used to have phones, there was a time we used to wear like two tracksuit bombs mm. and we used to put our phones inside in, in the tracksuit bomb. So if any guy came to you and said, hey, what's your phone? What you got for me? He said, I don't have nothing, you know, and they will fill the pockets. There's nothing in there, but the phone's on the inside pocket. We'll come out, we'll see like certain guys from the area with, they'll come out with these Averix jackets. I know you know about Averix. Yeah, I know about and Averix back in the day. The Averix jackets were just like up to here because they would rub, <laughs> <laughs> they would rub the Averix jackets from people and put it on and it would have no shame, but it was normal back then. You know, that's, that's, it was proper difficult there. So imagine having to walk and, you know, you have some type of valuables on you and you know that someone could actually try to stab you for the for what you have, you know. Everything was a goal, you know. And that's pretty much a norm there. Killing, stabbing, shootings, yellow boards up every minute. It was normal. You've normal. been stabbed, haven't you? Yeah, I've been stabbed as well. What was that like? Apart from very, very painful, I'm assuming. Well, it was... It was an experience. I'll, I'll describe it as an experience. I was quite young. I was 15. Nearly killed me. And... In the heart, right? Was well, it was close. Yeah. Very close yeah, to. Yeah, the chest. Yeah. Do you want to whip out a scar? Let's have a look. Yeah, why not? Come on. I'm not going to get mine out because you're in much better shape than I am. Yeah, so if you look at that camera there. Right here. Right there now. And the, the, the... Well, tell me about what happened. I know you've spoken about it previously, um, yeah. but not with me. Um... But what happened? So, I was, back then, we used to go to these parties, house parties, little clubs where the underage were allowed. And we used to do that all, all throughout the weekend. So, Friday, you know, obviously the first first night, whether it's a house party there, then we'll go to somewhere on Saturday and we'll go somewhere on Sunday, then back to school on Monday. And what we'll do is, if the party wasn't good, if it was dead, we would just hop to the next one. We'll find out, get on our phones. Oh, is there a little party there? We'll come in there now. Then come there. And this occasion, we went to one club in Oak Camp Road. It was like a family christening or something like that. And they turned into a party, as they do. And so there was a guy that came out. He just he lost his phone in the in the club. And he assumed it was us. So we was congregating, thinking about what, what we're going to do next, where we're going to go. 
they just started asking everybody for their phones. We didn't know what was going on. You know, give me your phone. Everybody's just looking at him. Like, what do you, what do you mean? Before anybody could um, even reply or, you know, just trying to get an understanding of what's going on, he was just stabbing people. Bang, stab. Give me your phone. This guy just whipped out his phone. Um, he came to me, give me your phone. I said, no, I didn't have a phone as well. But, you know, pride and ego stabbed me straight in the chest. And I just felt the the blood just trickling down, trickling down. So after a minute, you know, still trickling down. After two minutes, still trickling down. And now I'm starting to I'm starting to worry. I'm starting to panic now. I'm thinking, uh, I don't think this is just a poke. It was, it must be a serious injury. And he went inside. He found his phone. He came back outside. And everybody started asking everybody, you know, is everybody okay? And I didn't say anything, but I lifted up my top and my boxes were just soaked in blood. And everybody started panicking, called, called the ambulance. The guy came out and he was helping with me um, and apologizing and stuff like that. It's crazy. And before I knew it, I was I, I was in the ple- um, the ambulance to the on the way to the hospital. You know, short breaths, had a lot of internal bleeding. So restricting my um, lung capacity and yeah and had to have, have an operation woke up with my my dad by my bedside that's it do you remember the ambulance ride no you don't remember it no what's the first memory you have after the stabbing waking up and having your well dad i remember after the stabbing uh, there, was, there was a brief moment i blacked out and i woke up my friend slapping me trying to wake me up and um after that, I just, all I remember is my dad being there. Friends started to come and visit me every couple of days. I was in the hospital for a couple of weeks, a bit less than that. And then after I went home, I was very weak, lost a lot of blood, lucky to be alive. What was that like? I mean, I, I, I'm a, a parent and can imagine seeing my child, you know, laid up in bed with a, with a stab wound to the chest, fighting for their life. What was that like for your dad? Oh man, I put a lot of stress on my family, and uh, I think my my dad has never expressed how he felt even till till today, you know. But knowing him, I know he was he was really hurt. He was really hurt. What was that like for you? Because obviously, I mean, it, it started a chain of events whereby you you changed your life. You you've turned into a very successful man now. You you're a an example. Let's let's call it what it is. You're an example and an inspiration to a lot of people who are in that gang culture lifestyle and 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 have been in a similar situation to where you were then. Um, what was it like now, kind of looking back on on the stresses that you would have put your family through at the time? Looking back, as as a youth, you don't think about things like this. You don't think about the stresses that you could cause your your parents and how they feel about it because it's all an, an, an experience for you you know you're going into the world and you're not thinking about how they feel you're thinking about how you feel you're thinking about how what this is about what this experience is going to feel like but thinking of it now it's i actually felt re- like i feel sorry for my parents like i you know i think that was probably one of the key things that changed me because i wanted to make them feel proud of their their child of of their child not oh, this guy is just this this child is like a curse you know I didn't want to think I didn't want them to to perceive me like that so I wanted to do things to prove them prove to them that you know this this kid is special and I think that changed changed me what about your friends the friends that you were around at that time whatever happened to them some of them are still around now uh, um few of the friends that I used to hang around with back then, some of them, a lot of them are dead. A lot of them are in prison for life. Um, what else? A lot of them went on to do um, good things as well. They became really, really successful in different fields, acting, um, football, different sports. So it's, it's amazing because we, you know, we watch each other on social media. And to see the growth, they know where I came from mm. and I know where they came from. But it's nothing but respect and admiration for each other because we knew it's, it's not easy. It's not easy. It wasn't easy getting to where we are now. I suppose it breeds like a, a special type of mentality to be able to kind of 
exist in that world initially and then of course the strength that it takes to leave that and move on to other things it breeds a, a, i guess a, a unique outlook on life for for people who are involved in that absolutely absolutely you know to to have walked in my shoes back then you have to have a fixed set of skin you know some proper mental fortitude cojones yeah man, you need that you need some cojones for real you know trust me and I'm just glad to be able to talk, you know, talk about this on the other side of things mm. now. You know, there's mm. there's certain people that have start writing crazy numbers in prison, man. Thirty two years, you know, t- can't believe they they're still in that, in in where they are. You know, a lot of things have changed. The enemies and frenemies back then, the people that you we used to have beef with, they've literally have become close friends. You know, friends and supporters, supporters of my career, and you would never believe that these people are still in, in jail for for that beef. You know, for these you know beefs that that were going on back then. So they would literally meet them in prison and make peace, but they're still in jail for the mm. same mm. issues that they had prior to that. You know, I, I don't know. I can't describe to you how that feels because I. I'm not them, but it's that's crazy. That must be really depressing. Yeah, I mean, in its in its own way, it's nice that people who who have kind of been through a similar thing, or you know, if people are in prison doing a, a long time in prison, having somebody like you that they can, I guess, live through and kind of share your experiences and sharing your success is great in one way, but it's also very sad when you look at it from a human point of view. Yeah. That, they're not going to be able to do that for things that have happened years and years ago. And when you look at it and you look back at it as an adult and a successful adult as you are now, and you see kind of how petty it is and how in the grand scheme of life, those split seconds and those moments or the reputation of of, of you here or you there can affect you long after those things have gone away as a problem. You know, with the, being in that environment, you know, you just you develop a really poverty mindset poverty type way of thinking that's how i like to describe it and we don't think about the bigger picture it's only later on but when you when we think about it now especially some people that made it to the other side you know no criminal convictions and but were out and about and knew everything that was going on you know we 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 converse we converse with each other and we just say listen that was that was a waste of time that was a waste of our lives back then Honestly, that's the conclusion that we've reached. But it has built us in different ways mentally. It's helped me in my career, for sure. Mm. I can't deny that. And and them too. So, you know, everything happens for a reason. I'm just happy to be on this side of things. In a more positive note and kind of um, still staying with that, how much does it mean to you now to be able to give back? And how much does it mean to be able to... to show people and be an example to people who are maybe you know are in that poverty mindset and in that in that same situation that you were in and you can show them that look this is i was there too this happened to me i'm not going to pull my shut up but yeah. you've got a nice car here <laughs> are you sure you can, yeah, no uh, rich you, sun's you, coming up so rich, <laughs> right, so, so, just, just show people here so when we first met each other so we're going about five six years ago wasn't i slim yeah you was t- you was slim <laughs> you was almost like a different person <laughs> Should get a picture out. <laughs> also, while, we're, while we're also talking about pictures, so this is how how well I know Richard and, and certain other fighters from the original Miguel's gym, the Ted Bammy set up as it once yeah, was. Ted, Bammy, you know. um, Ted Dangerous Bammy. Ted Dangerous <laughs> Bammy. Um, your photo on BoxRec was taken by me. I didn't know that. Chris Congo's photo on BoxRec, taken by me. Crazy. So these are all like little bits and pieces from years gone by when I was a 12 stone, well, kind of part-time actor, part-time boxing and years and years ago when we first started. But yeah, I was uh, I was slim, Rich. Yeah, oh, you were slim. Know what happened to me? Boxing has really I, aged me. It it's me funny. Feel... One day I saw you, I thought, Rob, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't really laugh because it's quite sad. But <laughs> 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 I sacrificed my body to give you guys as, as good coverage as I possibly yeah. can. How's that? Oh, that's nice. The viewers are going <laughs> to drop some nice comments off there. Yeah, that's maybe sweet. so. <laughs> um, staying with um, your kind of life before boxing, really, a, a lot of people won't understand or won't know that you were something of a musician once upon a time. 
Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yep. No. Oh, oh. <laughs> could have been Jay Z. You could have been. You still could. But it hated on me. You still could be Jay Z. I'm gonna leave the rapper to a Coley. <laughs> Whoa, there we you go. Like so <laughs> you, you and a Coley could clash. What do you think to a Coley's new tune? Be I haven't honest. listened to it. I haven't listened to it yet. Shut up. No, honestly. But okay, well, we're going to play okay, it now. Play. We're going to get the live yeah. reaction now. All right. I can't believe you haven't heard it. Right, okay. And I want you to be honest. And we're going to talk about his fight soon. I know you have very complimentary things to say about his fight, yeah. but I want to know. I don't want to know what you think about his fight. I want to know what you think about his raps, huh? Okay. Okay. Right. Let me hear the bars. Bars. Okay, we've got, I'll give him my we've got honest ads. opinion. Okay, we've got ads first, day on. That's definitely not him. That's not him, no. Slightly too high-pitched yeah. to be Lawrence. He would have made it in, <laughs> as a musician by now then. That there voice. we go, right, okay. All right. You can watch the video as well. Okay. <laughs> I'll take you to the shot, that's your W. <laughs> Yeah, I, I very good voice. I've listened to yeah. it a lot of times because we had him on the podcast and I was putting a few bits together, so I've listened to it a lot and it's really grown on me. I really like it. Took it to the shard, that's your dobby. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna be playing it on the way home. Jeez. <laughs> that's your dobby. <laughs> see, well, see, at least we got the organic Jeez. reaction. I know you'd be very honest with it as well. Okay, yeah. first question who's a better rapper, you or him? I was definitely a better rapper. Yeah, there we on, go. Man. I knew that you Come weren't going to give him You know why? Up. Because I give them the melodies. You know, I'm a bit, you know, I'm, Yours how was would a I lot describe more myself? underground than that was. Yours was nah, like... man. I was overground. Come on, man. Check the views, man. My videos were all right. What was your tagging? Blacks? Yeah. yeah. SI. Yep. SI. That's, that, was the, that was the crew. Okay. I think the first, the first video we done, I think we got... Hold on, I'll play. Let me play. Let me find the so first I, ever song. I've got. Okay, go on. I found the first ever song that we did. This is taking a little bit of a musical turn on the Boxing Social podcast, but we're okay here. Remember to talk into the mic, Rich, whenever you're talking. Okay, then. But you're okay. Go mic on. Mic check one, two. We're back. <laughs> back for another go. Okay. Um. So 
So yeah, that's all. No, no, that's not. Yeah, it's this one. But seems like they took that. Oh, come on, Rich. They took the video, the original video. But I'm telling you, that done, that done numbers. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This is actually yeah. This is it. Go for this one. And the These ads. Well, to be fair, big up the ads. Um, watch all of the ads on this podcast, please. Everybody, don't skip them. They're all great ads. Uh, the earners more revenue. How much they're paying? Uh, well, it depends. I don't know. See, what I should have done is I should have played this for Lawrence when he was in there. Maybe I can get him next time. We want you, though. We want you. When do you come in? I'm coming in next, I think. I think I was so, pretty young. Was 2008, so July yeah. 23rd, 2008. Nearly 13 years ago, yeah. this was. Ooh! He's bad, man. He's bad. Bring back memories. <laughs> does it bring back memories? Yeah, of course, of course, it does. It does. Not memories, man. That's the thing with um, with the, the difference between you know. We'll put like, the whole video up. Don't worry. We're, we're, I got you. I got you. <laughs> anyway, go on. You were saying? No, but yeah, the the difference is like back in the days, that was for fun. You know yeah. what I mean? We did that like for fun. But the difference now is everybody does it just for like, I don't know, for, for that attention and stuff like that. Everything we spoke about, you know, was was real. You know, it wasn't really a, a joke for or you know, we didn't we didn't even know about numbers and internet. We didn't know anything like that. We just did it for fun. We loved it. But yeah, I loved the music back in the days. But then, you know, I just kind of I took a step back because I just realized, you know, it was I just became I became a different person. You know, just wanted to influence influence people for the better, and I know how powerful music is. You know, and mm. you know when you listen to music, it goes straight into the subconscious. You know, mm. so just want to kind of do something else. Is that what it's like for you now? Because obviously, a lot of people might surprise people, but I'm a massive grime fan, and like, grime. Uh, yeah, and over the years, like Nasty Crew, DWE. Well, yeah, I mean, DWE is like, a, so I saw DWE at, um, so my 21st birthday, I went to Outlook Festival in Croatia, which was like drum and bass, dubstep, but grime as well. So it was like P-Money, Newham Generals. Oh, like, yeah. Okay. Old, like, so P-Money's like always been my favorite. So okay. after everybody listened to Boy in the Corner when they were younger, yeah. and then the, but the first album that kind of off the back of that that I really got into was P-Money is Power when that originally first came out. But as you mentioned, kind of, lyrics and bars and like the themes that run through it doesn't always promote uh, a positive lifestyle um when yours came out so you were 18 in that video or there thereabouts that was a couple of years after you were stabbed so it wasn't off straight after you were stabbed that you kind of made a conscientious yeah. decision to leave that lifestyle behind you you yeah. continued with that mm, I'm assuming there was a slight change if nothing yeah. else or, or you continued with that lifestyle for a couple of years after you were yeah. stabbed so yeah, it was a few years after and I feel like after the stabbing, it kind of planted a seed and things started to change in me. I started to understand the idea of investing, investing in myself, thinking about where I want to be in the next 10 years. I never thought in that way till I got to around, you know, 16, 17, 18. Mm. And that, that's when the change became a bit more apparent. Um, I, you know, I, First of all, I stopped going to the parties often. You know, um, how so long was your recovery period? Sorry to interrupt. How long was your like re your your recuperation? How long before you were kind of back to normal after being stabbed like oh, that? Man, it took it took probably a year and a bit more because I remember maybe like six months after I was playing fight in the on the play, in the playground, and one of the year elevens they punched me in my chest, and I saw stars. It felt like. Like I just got punched in my eye, 
and I, I start, I felt faint, and I realized, you know, the probably my body's not healed, you know, the bone's not healed properly, and we don't, I don't know what type of, you know, how long it would take for me to feel normal, but that was definitely not normal, a normal feeling. So it took a good year and a bit. Did you ever serious? Oh, I don't know you, you would have done it to a degree seriously anyway, but like, did you ever seriously consider trying to pursue music full time as your your kind of end goal career? Was it kind of, did it go hand in hand with you sort of leaving that lifestyle behind? I was, uh, to be honest, I did kind of take, I just, I, I always wanted to make like money from music and, mm. and make it from yeah, music. Yeah, I mean, I know there would have been a, a definitely yeah. a degree after, of that for sure. Yeah. After a while, probably a bit more than than my, the people that I used to make music with. I have saw a lot of opportunities and we was quite big at, at a certain time. We used to go to radio stations, private radio stations to do like on top, on top of them and stuff like that. Mm. And yeah, we started to create a decent name for ourselves. You know, a lot of people followed us. A lot of people followed us. I remember I saw Fredo. Yeah, not too not too long ago, I was training in. I forgot this gym. This name of this gym. I think it's Harbour Club. And yeah, he was like, "Yeah, I grew up listening to you. It's crazy. <laughs> that's like, crazy. Oh, that's crazy. Back. Imagine <laughs> he's telling me that. Like, yeah, I grew up listening to you. He knew exactly who I was. <laughs> and um, yeah, it just shows that you know, music is powerful. You know, people people listen. But at the same time, it's like, what message are you putting out there? Yeah, I I can't be proud of me putting out, you know, message to kind of influence you to do do nonsense and get yourself involved in um in a whole <laughs> crazy lifestyle. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, for some people's entertainment, but some people do take it literally. You know, they're not intelligent enough to kind of discern. You know, this is just music. This is entertainment. Don't take it like like that and go out and do the things right. that's being said because probably not everything is true what's being said yeah. yeah it's just entertainment and you know i just thought you know people are taking it literally now i don't want to be one of them f i don't want to have that on my conscience mm. you know and i remember people used to come to me and say certain things say oh i listen to your music and i'm just pumped like mm. like it's like i'm just i don't know man. i need to stop listening to it. it's too it's it's making me it's, it's turning me a certain way and i thought Wow, that's mm. that's power man that's mm. powerful uh, but it's not really good in my opinion and i just wanted to give back a bit more and that's when i kind of took a step back from that after that i got into boxing got into boxing straight away i, I, I said you know what i want to i want to switch it up and i thought boxing boxing would suit me because i, I kind of saw myself as a tough man mentally physically strong and uh, a close friend of mine he introduced me to boxing. He took me to the boxing gym, and I was going. I was going every day. I think I was going like about three times a week, and I, was, I realized I had a good, a lot of power, a lot of power compared to the, all the rest of the people in the gym. And yeah, I just kept at it, kept at it from there. Do you remember the first time you walked into a boxing gym? Always ask fighters that. No, I don't. No, I don't remember actually. I do remember vividly. You know, lot loads of people in there. And I just felt really, you know, insecure. I didn't know what to do. You know, I just needed direction. Like, what's this? What's this about? How'd you skip? How'd you do that? I don't know. How'd you f throw punches? But I was on it though. Was it straight away? As in, like, you know, once uh, people often talk about the boxing bug. You go in there, you get bit by the bug, and that's it. And you're away before you realize it. I know you didn't have loads of amateur fights. You only had a few amateur fights. But before you know it, you're boxing the amateurs, and then before you know it, you've turned pro. And it, was that that way for you, or was it something that you you kind of picked up gradually? Yeah, I picked up gradually. I didn't know the system or mm -hmm. how it worked. I just was going to the gym and just seeing how how it goes, and and then I used to daydream about me having a fight, and that used to kind of scare me. <laughs> I thought like I'd, it's something that I've never done before. You know, I've had a fight on the streets, but it's different to having a fight in a ring. You know, someone's training for you to knock you out, to really hurt you. And, you know, you. I'm wondering, uh, like, am I training enough? Is this enough? Or do I need to train harder than this? So, oh, man, it was nerve-wracking, honestly. What was your first fight like? So I remember when it was a Lynn ABC and all of my friends were boxing on the show. It was a dinner show. And I was the last person because, you know, the heavier you mm. are, the, the layer you on on the card so I was waiting around all day and 
What was that like? Coach. The nerves, like waiting around for your first damage, going last as well, and waiting, watching everybody. Did that make it yeah, easier? Yeah, it was tough. Or it worse? didn't make it easier. That made it even <laughs> worse, and it and it made it even even more worse because one of my uh, coaches back then he said to me, "Rich, everybody's won. Go out there and win. No pressure." <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't believe what he said to me. He's like, are you being serious in my head? I was like, damn, that's tons of pressure now. But as soon as I got in there, it's like, I remember in the first round, I, I threw a shot and then, you know, it felt like, I don't know, like I used to play fight night a lot, fight night round two, three. Three was my favourite and it, it was exactly the same. You could hear mum was getting shouts, come on, come on the Reds, come on the Reds, come on the Blues. I'm like, what the f- this is crazy this is just like the game I thought this is just this is the game this is crazy and then I was throwing the jab and then I f- he just I, f- I landed a good shot and he grimaced and he just came for me and I just I was on my bike straight away but then I landed one clean shot I think it was like a one two he was out like on his feet but I left him and I just kept on moving around and when I got back into the corners my um, coaches told me, obviously, what are you doing? Finish this and let's go home. You got him there. Why did you let him recover? And then I jumped back in and finished him in the second round. And that was that was history. Crazy. How does the, the rush of boxing competition compare to the street stuff that you got yourself into? The, the adrenaline. How is it different and how is it the same? That's a good it? question. That's a really good question. Thanks, Rich. Let me think. Um, hmm. Okay. With with boxing, it's like you're going you're go you're getting into a fight. You're getting into a fight. But you know you're gonna be alive at the end of the fight. Well, you know especially if you're an amateur, you know, you're not gonna think you're gonna die in the ring. And even even though people do pass in the ring, mm. you know, but at that time I never heard of, of fighters passing in the ring. So and thankfully it is extremely yeah, rare. Like yeah, it's quite rare, yeah. yeah. So it was nerve wracking, but because of the having like the nerves from the streets like coming out and you have problems with other people knowing that you could actually die today for real. You know, you could get stabbed. You hear hear about other people that you know getting stabbed and dying. People getting shot for no reason and just waiting in the wrong places and being in a, being there at the wrong place at the wrong time. And you're thinking, what the hell is boxing? That's nothing. <laughs> that's this is this is easy this is this is like easy peasy like yeah. I'm just jump in the ring from my hands i don't have to worry about being stabbed and shot and stuff like that that's this is perfect so the drilling was was different on the streets that drilling is different you know you're you're paranoid every day you know just thinking whether the police are going to come for you or your enemies are going to come find you you turn one corner you hear so many different crazy stories and you're just thinking that could be you one day so you know the adrenaline rush is much different it's higher in that type of lifestyle because you know anything can happen to you in at any minute you know you might be here today gone tomorrow this might be your last day coming out so it's a different mentality and sometimes you just can't prevent it it's I'm, just, I'm yeah. guessing it sort of helps really with the adrenaline and the nerves and what have you that comes with from fighting. If you're coming from that background and you, you're used to living with that type of stress or that type of you know that type of mental stress on you, yeah. I'd imagine that does help when you're when you're going into kind of one-on-one sanctioned combat. Yeah, of course. You know, like I don't know. You know, the mentality back then. Like for instance, I remember having trouble with different. There's different things that you learn from being in that type of lifestyle. Like for instance, like when I, I'll drive, but when I come to, you know, let's say traffic light, I'll make sure that there's like a car or half a car space in front of me. So if any car comes beside me or cuts me, I'll just spin out. And it was just things like that, you know, um, would do even if you park up as well, just in case, you know, because anything can happen anytime. Um, being alert, you're very conscious of of your surroundings and always calm, always must, calm. Must be exhausting, like living with that type of day. Yeah, it's crazy. It's, it's crazy. I mean, you have to be, you know, really, really calm. You know, and you can't panic. When you panic, that's when 
yeah, the adrenaline rush kind of takes over and you you know you lose breath you know very quickly um even if you were to get stabbed i learned that obviously from being stabbed as well if you panic too much and you're not calm you can lose more blood than you know than anticipated you know things things like that i learned from yeah from that type of lifestyle Mo- moving on to professional boxing um talk to me about that initial early phase that miguel's gym phase ted dangerous bammy yourself <laughs> pester chris congo isaac chamberlain dillian white obviously knocking about miguel's gym at the time talk to me about that early stage of your professional career and what that was like for you yeah that was a that was an interesting saga for me i remember i graduated from university and i decided that i want to go pro that wasn't an easy um decision for me to make and the reason why is because i heard about the the injuries that you could could sustain from from boxing and brain damage etc you know everybody talks that they they talk they spoke about that a lot in my in my family in and around my area and you know that's one of the fears that stopped few people from turning professional and stuff uh and yeah so i had to kind of really think about it you know it took me a while and then that's when I made a decision. I didn't know what to expect. And then I started to train. Train with Ted Bami. And Isaac was doing really well. Then on Sky Sports, all the bills. And I wanted to get there. I wanted to get on the shows. I wanted to be where Isaac was. And I knew Isaac because Isaac used to train with me from the Lynn in the, my amateur boxing gym. I seen him grow, grow up. And we grew up to, together pretty much. And... I was just like, yeah, this is this is what I want to do, training, training, training. But it was not as easy as I thought. You know, Ted Bami was more pushing Isaac, if anything. Mm. You know, they're from the same country, um, um, related. You know, makes made sense. And I kind of found myself in just helping out Isaac a bit more. You know, inspired him a lot, and jumping on different shows. And Ted did what he could to to help me and yeah it was it was a fun experience though it was a fun experience and we said have you know a little nice a nice team it was good Mm. energy Mm. because everybody was competing against each other whether we was training um ted bam had a decent setup decent system so and it was all about discipline and like for example if isaac had a fight isaac he would take isaac phones you know he can't be on his phones you know this is serious sleep at a certain time he, have to, he has to stay with me you know that type of father figure because he's been there before you know I think he, I think he won a European yeah he was European yeah. champion he European won like champion. a I think he won like a WBF title World at Boxing one point Federation. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think, yeah, he won I think like, that was big back then yeah, yeah. yeah kind of similar to like the IBO, IBO. now oh, okay. around that kind of yeah so yeah he was he, kn- he knew about boxing he knew what you know what it takes so and he wanted to help help everybody else get up there and yeah, and I think after it kind of it fizzled out and everybody went their separate ways, certain things happened, led to everybody taking, uh, making different decisions to go different places. And I found myself with Mark Tibbs. Mm. Always about the, before we talk about Mark Tibbs, always somebody I'm very, very um, keen to discuss. A bit of a shame how that the, 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 the Ted Bammy stable kind of broke up and went their separate ways. Remember my early, some of my earliest memories of boxing or working in boxing, we're coming down to Miguel's gym and doing yep. bits and pieces with you guys. I remember that interview. Yeah. It's funny, people, people don't know, like, the, the journey, you know, you actually came, this was this was at a time where I was trying to get a vi- um, an interview with, like, different broadcasters, different platforms, like IFL, and you came down and gave me your time. You sat down and had an interview. I felt like a superstar. No, honestly, like you, I thank you for that because it kind of it it gives you hope. It gives the young fighters hope, you know, when you come and spend time. Like, who would want to come and sit down and in, interview me? Like, who who the, who the hell am I? You know, what I mean, I'm just trying to make my name. Like, there's Isaac, there, there's you know Chris Congo, and I'm just trying to make make my name. But you you spent time, you gave me your energy, and you asked me some really good questions. You know, really questions, and and we built up a little little profile as well in the beginning so yeah i appreciate that thank you for that uh, yeah, yeah, is. <laughs> <laughs> i didn't tell him to say that by the way <laughs> no i thank um, you for that honestly no yeah i mean kind of as i it was as beneficial to me as it was to you at the time yeah. um, making a, an early start in boxing is always 
you know, as a boxing fan, it's always a pleasure to sit down and speak to any boxer, whether you're four and oh, forty and oh, or whatever. It, it, you know, I feel like everybody who who boxes deserves respect, and everybody has an interesting story. Some of the most interesting stories are stories that aren't told because fighters, for whatever reason, aren't in the position to tell those stories, aren't given the platform or the opportunity to do so. So, yeah, thank you very much for that. Yeah. Uh, it, it was my pleasure. Um, discussing, you mentioned Chris Congo then. Chris is another one who, um, around that time, was struggling to get on bills. Um, yeah. Was boxing on the small hall. Um, I remember watching. I remember watching you and Chris fight on the same show on John Hardin's Instagram Live. So I remember watching your early. I can't remember if it was maybe a second or third fight or something. What does it mean for you now to be on a similar level and a similar platform and see Chris come up as well? Because now Chris got that great win over Luther Clay. Yeah. He's boxing on Dillian's undercard this weekend. Yeah against Michael McKinson, that must give you so much joy to see somebody else who is in a similar position to you get his due now and get his opportunities as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Just seeing him come through and and do what everybody believed that he could do is an amazing feeling because I've been there. I know what it takes and I know how it feels. It's great to have that support and f especially from genuine people that actually want to see you win. And I understand how it's come from to come from mm. boxing on the small shows. And I want to say a big thanks to Mo, Mo Pryor. Mm. You know, Mo, he came and, you know, he signed us and he gave us opportunity to box. He could he could have done more for us if he had the, the opportunities. If there was a bigger platform, he would have first day heard, yeah, I could punch. Okay, I hope you can fight. He has an interesting story. Okay, let's put him on. And then support, see, supported us financially as well. You don't get a lot of managers that do that, you mm. know, especially coming up. And it was just based off just word of mouth. Oh, this guy could be something in the future. Trust me, trust me, this guy, Richard Riakpo, Chris Congo, just follow them. And I'll never forget the people that helped me out in the early early part of my career. That's why why I mentioned the, you doing the interview. You might think it's nothing, but. No. Uh, is at a time where you know we're just running around trying to get a, a, a interview on IFL TV, begging, you know, on, honestly, like trying to get interviews on platforms just to kind of build our name, just to just to he let somebody hear us out and just generate some type of interest. You know, it's it's not easy coming from that, and only a few people make it through, which is is pretty sad to say. You know, a lot of people come into the game thinking, "Yep, yeah, I'm gonna make it," but it doesn't doesn't work like that. Like that, you know, certain certain people are chosen. Sometimes pre it's pretty much based on who you know as well, and um, you know, ticket selling, of course. But it's it's difficult, man. It's it's a proper difficult game. It's yeah. hard to find some good people in this game. Yeah, it is, and, and being able to fight is just one part of it. The, yeah, that's the, that's the, one part of the, the business. A lot, there's lots of good fighters yeah. out there who people <laughs> have never heard of. Loads. And they will never hear from them for whatever reason because, you know, they don't sell tickets or because yeah. their face doesn't fit or because they're not very good in front of a camera. Yeah. Or they maybe have all of those things, but they still, something, somewhere doesn't add up. They're and lacking. So, yeah. yeah, and so and for some people, you literally look at them and you go, you look great, you talk great, you can fight, but you can't get a fight, you can't get on a show, yeah. promoters don't want to touch you or whatever. And it is, it is difficult. And, you know, boxing for all of its all of the great things that it does for taking people from kind of nowhere to somewhere, there yeah. are people who, who deserve the opportunity to get there and through one reason or another, no fault of their own, they're, they're not given that opportunity. So anything that anybody can do to, to kind of give somebody a chance, what you do with your chance is entirely up to you. But um, as long as people get that chance is, is, is what's important. Um, so Mark Tibbs, she left Ted, um, Mark Tibbs, who's credited for you know for the work that he's done, particularly with Dillian White, um, up until Dillian's fight with Alexander Vivek, you know they, they split or they separated shortly before then. Um, got a lot of credit for the work that he did with Dillian as well as yourself. Um, what was it like working with Mark? I know there was a I love Mark. A, a really interesting <laughs> dynamic in the gym. Like pie mash and liquor. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like working with Mark Tibbs? Yeah, Mark. Mark is a he's a fun guy. You know he's very optimistic positive type of person and he's very loyal you know if he's with you he's with you to the death like if we if we're going to fight x he's going to fight x too like he's in it with me you know and 
I love the people like that, you know, just all for one and one for all, you know, that type of mentality. He was, you know, very simple with the boxing, you know, simple and effective. And he had that experience as well, you know, that he knew how to deal with certain type of opponents. He, it was just really, really simple, real, real, real simple things. And, you know, it just, it just kind of goes back, you know, simplicity is the key, you know, simple things that that's sharp jab and stuff. And we work off that, work off that. And then we add more to the game, but we'll, we'll crawl before we run, crawl before we walk, you know, slowly. But yeah, it was, a, it was a great experience with him. The only reason why, you know, it, it, um, we never continue our relationship is only because I, I got an opportunity to to train at Loughborough University, and I had a new structure and I wanted to take the boxing to another level, but I knew it's going to be difficult for him to be travelling up and down. You know, he had a lot of fires at the time, and he has even more now. Mm. He has way more now, and big names as well. So it was always going to be difficult, and I knew Mark. You know, I knew Mark, and I knew that it would definitely be difficult for him. So. I just had to tell him and then we just left it as that. But very close still. Yeah, I was going to say, I still see him give you uh, shout outs and yeah. props on his social media yeah. and stuff. He's a funny <laughs> guy on social media sometimes. He comes out some interesting <laughs> bits. Because, yeah, we, we we crack a lot of jokes. We used to crack a lot of jokes. We used to laugh all the time, you know, because even though it's intense in the ring and everybody wants to win, but it's an experience as well. It's life. It's a journey. And if we're learning and um learning anything about life that we can that can you know make us better people then this that's great and we've made a lot of memories now one thing that we've skated over that i wanted to talk to you about was you know the, the period of, of time at the start of your career when you struggled for exposure you struggled to get big fights or any fight really then you get a chance on the dillian white lucas brown undercard against adam williams and you yeah. end up on the floor in the first round. <laughs> Heavy knockdown as well. Yeah. You might say he slipped, but he got dropped hard. Nah, I just, you know, it was. I just, there was a banana. <laughs> so, uh, see that um, that TikTok that I was watching there? Yeah. Just one of those Mario Kart. So I was like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wasn't one of them. It was a proper <laughs> knockdown. Um, what was that like? Because I imagine, considering where you come from in your life and, yeah. and how difficult it was to get that opportunity, getting dropped in the first round heavy banana skins aside yeah must have been pretty terrifying at the time you know what I was, I was pissed off i was so angry and upset because eddie hearn was watching me for the first time <laughs> <laughs> eddie hearn is there i'm like listen i'm gonna have a dance today you know i'm gonna get on i'm gonna make sure that this guy just like i impress this guy you know to cut it, to keep it simple and I go out there. There was a lot going on in my life at that time, to be honest. And um, no excuses. But anyway, I got in there. And the next thing I know, I was uh, I was being counted. You know, I was I was on my feet. That's what I remember. You know, I remember throwing a shot. Next thing you know, I remember counting, um, being counted, and I'm I'm up on my feet. So I don't remember me, you know getting dropped or getting up. <laughs> That's the next thing you know, I just knew this guy's going to rush. He's going to rush in. He's try trying to get me out. I knew, obviously, I, I became conscious of what happened. Then um, I just heard Eddie Hearn. I heard Eddie Hearn in the corner. He's like, hold, hold. Then he was like, Richard, where's the, where's the uppercut? Where's the uppercut, Richard? He said, That's it. That's it. Then he was just kind of encouraging me there. And um, I kind of found it because I remember I was discussing with my brother. I was like, this is the shot I'm going to knock out, well, out with. I'm going to throw an uppercut and hook to the body. Or is it going to be uppercut then hook to the head? But I was telling my brother, this, this shot I'm going to knock out, out with. And I think that the the shot in the end, I, I hit, him with a, hit him with a few shots. I had to kind of fight him because he was pressuring me a lot. And then I hit him with an uppercut and hook to the body. That was the end of the fight because he kind of had some weird type of guard. You know, just kept it up. But yeah, it was a good, you know, I was, even though I won, I was still really upset because um, I wanted to really impress. You're but, too um, eager to impress, do you think? Yeah. That's why, one for the, you know, for the for the, um, young prospects trying to come out, listen, don't, <laughs> don't, don't try to impress, man, for the, for the cameras and just because people are, are there in attendance, trust me, just keep it nice and simple, listen to your corner. Because you come out trying to do that, you can end up getting sparked. 
Yeah. And you might not get up. Well, it's a, it's a huge learning fight, a huge a huge learning curve within the fight. I mean, the fight itself was, you know, something that you can look back on, as was your fight with Sam Hyde. Now, I remember your fight with Sam Hyde. I remember being, it was at Manchester Arena, so Usyk Bellew on the card. Yeah. And um, I remember being locked out of not knowing where to get into the, the arena. And it was a massive arena, as Manchester Arena is. Anybody who knows who's been there will tell you. And I remember being sent from every different bloody entrance to every one. And I was desperate to get in to watch your watch fight it. against Sam Hyde. And I remember waiting in the queue and people going, Sam Hyde's winning four rounds to one, five rounds to one. What happened in that fight? Because that was another fight that was a big stage and a big step up for mm -hmm. you. By your own admission, you didn't perform that night. Yeah. You ultimately got the stoppage, which well, you know, when you check box rec and you look in the, it's Richard Riappel wins by TKO. Mm -hmm. So you move on with your unbeaten record intact. But how did you feel on that night? What was that like? Because you didn't perform anywhere near to your capability that night. You know what? It was just experience. It was experiences dealing with, with the night, a lot of pressure and, you know, wanting to make sure I win. I wanted to win that title really badly. Just wanting it maybe too much as well. You know, wanting to impress, wanting to get the job done, but not thinking about enjoying myself as well in the process and, and relaxing. You know, things things like that I had to learn about that. I learned a lot from that fight, to be honest. And it was difficult in there, you know, just... This guy I was fighting, I think I had like seven fights or something mm. like that. And mm. he had like double my fights and loads of ring experience. Making like he's amateur. done loads of rounds and amateur experience. Oh my God. I was really up against it, but I didn't really, I didn't realize what I was really up against until I got in there. He just knew how to deal with me. He had to close me down. He knew how to negate the jab. I was throwing some terrible jab. Listen, I, I, had, I had a lot to deal with in that, in that ring there. I had to literally just fight this guy push him back and find a shot because i was i was really down on the cards and i think after 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 what well, i think i threw i threw a shot i threw a, a right hook you know it was just a nice like check right hook clipped him and then i just saw his eyes start to swell up and you know that's when i start to press him and and target target that to get him out there you know yeah. it's just that simple i didn't realize how how bad it was mm. at all. Horrible. I watched the the video back, and it, it looked like he had a hematoma or something. I don't know, mm. but that was been disgusting. But in there, it was like all my objective was to win by any means necessary, and that's the type of mentality that I take into to all my fights. So yeah, just just it was a good learning fight, and I think I I got the Tommy McCarthy fight straight after that, and everybody was like, yeah, listen, Tommy McCarthy is actually better than Sam Hyde. Like that's a mad, mm. <laughs> that's a mad fight. No, that's a mad fight for you. You know it's gonna be tough. I remember even talking to Coogan. Coogan saying, "Man, Tom McCarthy was like, damn, yeah, respect, respect. You know that's the only way you're gonna learn, Richard. You know you just have to, you just have to take it up. He's a tough man. He's a tough man. I remember he fought for the British title. And I wasn't even thinking about British and and cap mm. capturing that title. Then I was thinking, yeah, that's maybe in the future, but." You know, we're dealing with Tom McCarthy now. He fought for the British and he did well. He got knocked down and got back up and fought this guy. And this guy was a, a solid veteran type of um, fighter. He's uh, another fighter. Who had Matty Askin. Yeah. yeah. Solid fighter mm. with loads of experience. And, you know, I think my mindset changed. I, I went in there and I learned a lot from, from the rounds, going into the corner and, and hearing what Mark had to say to me. Yeah, and... I took that all on board and that changed everything. They changed how I was boxing. I, I don't think I really knew what I was doing, you know, for the Sam Hyde. I didn't know how to win, win rounds. I didn't know how they score. I didn't really study the game like that. It was just just going in there and just trying to think, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Had power, had physicalities, etc. So, But yeah, I learned how to like win rounds after that. You know, how to press them and do different things, relax a bit more and enjoy. I think that's the main thing. When I started to relax and enjoy myself, I started tension was away and mm. I could get more power more you know just everything changed from there that Sam Hyde fight you won the WBA intercontinental strap now I speak to a lot of fighters we talk about it a lot kind of the we even spoke about it earlier on today on the podcast about kind of British Commonwealth European world titles and then like the 
it's probably a more modern thing, like the WBA Continental, Intercontinental, International belts. And people often talk about the difference in the prestige between the British title and English title, a WBA International or what have you. Winning that first belt, what was that like? Getting that WBA Intercontinental around your waist, what was that like? What was that feeling like? Man, that was like a world title to me. That was like getting my name in the history books. This is the first fight that I can have my name recorded in the history books. Like our Richard Rackpool won the WBA Intercontinental title. You know, WBA probably I think the first the first ever recognized world recognized belt. I think that mm. belt I recognized um, organization that recognized world champions and stuff. And it was credible. Like, like I t- I just that's all I wanted. That's all I wanted because. Uh, you know, I'll, I, you know, I care about legacy. I care about writing my name in the books, and that's all I want. I just wanted that title. I wanted to be the champion, and that's why you know, I really went for that fight. Even though I felt like I was on E, I was thinking, yeah, I'm gonna learn something about myself. You know, in that fight, I just learned that I'm able to kind of find something in me to push me further. And I, I always thought that was normal, but everybody said that's not normal. That's that's a special thing that you got and I've done it even in the amateurs you know being down a lot but I'll come back out when you think I'm done and then push it and and still manage to get the win you know and that's that's good you know that's a good attribute to have I think I think we saw kind of the confidence boost and the, the difference that it made in your next fight against Tommy McCarthy and you mentioned kind of Sam Hyde having in-ring experience. Tommy McCarthy had more. You know, he was he was a very decorated amateur. He um he did very well as an amateur and did very well indeed as a pro. He's now European champion. Mm-hmm. Um, getting the win over him in the style that you did as well. Um, getting the stoppage. How much confidence did you gain from that? On the particularly on the back of the Sam Hyde fight, where I think it's fair to say the jury was still very much out on yeah. you after that Sam Hyde fight. I was good. I think everybody was shocked about the improvements. Mm. Obviously, the people around me, they know what I could do. You know, they see me all the time. They know what I'm capable of. But it's you, know, you boxing in the gym and doing everything in the gym is not the same as doing everything in, in the ring. So you see people putting up videos, hitting the pads and looking amazing, but then they jump in the ring and it's a different story. You'd be like, where's all that pad work? Where's all that flashy stuff? Like, you don't do nothing. Like, you can't even... You look like a different fighter. Mm. But we... It was just kind of getting that, that, that right... And translating everything that we were doing in the gym, in the ring, and that night we got it right. We just, just keep it nice and simple. Jab, move, move, jab, move, and just wait, wait for the opportunity, land up the right, and then that's it. Just nice and simple. So yeah, that that definitely gave me more confidence, and I just realised that I definitely have a a skill. And guess what? It was really early as well. Mm. So if I can, you know, dispatch somebody of that quality out. Especially coming off a terrible performance against Sam Hyde, gosh, like what potential have I got? And that's what made you know that's what kind of generated a lot more interest. So yeah, I was definitely confident. I was definitely confident in myself, but I knew you know I knew I could do it for sure. Now cruiserweight's one of my favourite domestic divisions. Um, you've been matched as tough as anybody in that. You kind of look for your you go look for your box rack. Your box rate, Sam Hyde, Tommy McCarthy, Chris Billum Smith, then Jack Massey. Now, Chris Billum Smith um, obviously boxed this past weekend, somebody I know very well. First and foremost, I think you and Chris are probably two of the nicest people that I've met in boxing. Um, two of the two of the most honest and the, you know nicest fights that I've come into contact with uh, was pretty difficult when you when you boxed yeah, each other. To, yeah, I can imagine. I, don't, I think um, he was telling me. Yeah, I don't, I because don't, I in my job, you know, it's, you don't you don't take sides you try not to pick favorites and things like that but but (laughs) inevitably when it comes to something like inevitably when you spend as much time around people sometimes in boxing and particularly the kind of the quite visceral nature of boxing in general you do happen you know you you do build an affinity towards people you do build relationships and you know friendships in some instances and seeing you two box each other, I remember I came to see you in Loughborough and we did yeah. like the head-to-head thing where I'd asked you and Chris the yeah. same questions and we chopped them together. Um, and mm. I remember just all that I wanted from that fight was who were, both of you to come out healthy and both yeah. of you to emerge from the fight, having done yourselves justice, given a good performance, and whoever won, 
won. That's the honest truth. Mm-hmm. I didn't want either one to win. It's funny. I, I remember that that f- building that you know. I remember that build up that you wanted to do, mm. and I remember I was talking to um, some of the team and stuff. I ended up actually having an argument with Dillian over that because mm. I just wanted to focus on the boxing. I didn't want to do no media, mm. and uh, I was just in the zone. I knew it was going to be. A, uh, it's not. Uh, it wasn't an easy fight. It wasn't mm. going to be an easy. Because at the time, people didn't really know anything about Chris. Billings yeah, he didn't time, know, but he was. He was uh, like he did really well. I remember him in the amateurs. Mm. Like he was solid. Like this mm. guy. I don't know if he won the ABAs and like he was one of those guys that listen you're going against a, a really good fighter he knows what he's doing he's been boxing for a long time and everybody knew he was going to be good and, and I, the first thing I noticed in the ring was when we when we box his shape he held his shape really well like throughout the fight mm. and his movement was different it was, it was good it was sharp what are your memories of that fight I remember you were hurt in that fight so end of the ninth round, was it? You were hurt. Punch, listen, he's a day. He punched in the back of the head, didn't he? He's a dirty one, you know. You're a dirty boy, a Chris Billum Smith. You're real dirty, yeah. yeah. <laughs> What's wrong? I see you. No, <laughs> but that that was a close fight. You hit him yeah. with some big shots in that fight. You yeah. you've got a, an absolute cannon of a right hand on you, as you know. Um, you got a chin though. He has no. got a chin, and he had to have a chin yeah. in that fight to take those shots. Yeah. Um, where did that rank for your hardest fights? That you've had as a professional, hmm. it's got to be right. Up that there. was up there, but it wasn't flipping up. With Sam Hyde, like it was, mm. that was tough. Well, I'm guessing for tough. kind of more external reasons, for kind of you yeah. not performing in that fight. Whereas you feel like you but performed. Behind, we we're behind all the okay, chips. Yeah. We we're behind, yeah. and the only way for us to win was to get the stoppage, to force mm. that stoppage, mm. you know, and to find that that that. In fact, when I go to a lot of the schools, um, a lot of the secondary schools, I use that video as testament to, you know, it's never over until it's over. Um, you know, just carry on pushing because even though the chips are down, you don't know how how it could end. You know, don't never give up. Mm. You know, I always kind of use that as an example that anything you want in life, you can get it. You know, just sometimes you might go through it's like it's it's almost like an analogy of life you know you don't start well things keep on going wrong and, and you just don't understand what's going on and then bang you end up as the champion you end up winning mm. and yeah I, i'd use that fight as a to as an analogy of what i want to you know the message i want to kind of pass on to the to the students and stuff but yeah that was i think that was definitely up there and then definitely probably um chris Miller smith after straight after that it's sort of yeah. a strange one, really, because Chris had been boxing longer than you had and had more experience in some aspects. Yeah. But you entered that as kind of, again, on the back of Sam Hyde, Tommy McCarthy fights. It was Chris's first big test, the first time he'd ever been on a on a stage even really you know, remotely similar to that. I know he yeah. boxed at the bottom of some some big cards in the past, George Groves, Chris Eubank Jr. I remember he opened the show. Um, but there was nobody there. This was quite different to being on a pay-per-view show with you. Uh, did you feel kind of how did you feel in the fight did you did you feel like you did yourself justice on the night did you feel you obviously were coming off a career best win a lot of people predicted you to to stop him, chris in yeah. that fight um yeah. because it was his first fight at that level yeah. how did you feel that fight went yeah i was confident i think i was probably overconfident though going into that fight you know i just for some reason i didn't respect him i didn't think he's you know, I see Chris Billings Smith as a really nice guy. You know, he's like a proper gentleman. You know, <laughs> and I see him like a proper nice guy. Like everything is just an act. Like, yeah, oh, you want some of this big man? You want some of this big boy? I'm like, listen, I know you're not like this, man. <laughs> Stop it, Chris, man. Just be yourself. <laughs> and that really, but he's a fighter though in the ring. Mm. At the same time, you know, even though I knew he wasn't like that, but you know, I was just that's why I didn't rate him. And you can tell I was laughing, like even in the way, and I was just laughing. And I'm like this guy's looking at my eyes, like he's gonna, he's gonna kill me. You know what I mean? I'm like, you, come on, man, stop it, stop this. Man. But anyway, it's um, yeah, no, I, I got respect for him. He's a fighter, and he came in there and he gave me a head of a fight, you know. And he's a, he's a good fighter. He's a really good fighter. I think the performance on the weekend, you know, it was off. But I don't, you know, I think you know every like that's the thing about boxing fans. You know, everybody expects everybody to perform, you know every single time but you know every single sport is just not like that you know it's football everybody has their their bad days in the in the office and then they have the good days in office are they on today they, they might be off today a little bit but uh, on, on the weekend they might be flipping on fire it's just that's how it goes 
but yeah just certain things he needs to learn you know he needs to he needs to work on like everybody everybody's mm. got things to work on i don't like to judge people because i know listen i know firsthand i've been in there myself i know how difficult it is and that's why i, I like to keep quiet but um yeah it was it was good it was a good fight for me good in, learning for in, in its own way he his fight with you was quite similar to your not necessarily because the fights weren't the same they didn't play out the same way but you were his first big test really as yeah. a professional obviously you'd had those with tommy mccarthy with sam hyde and i feel like i don't know if you'll agree with me i feel like he's developed and progressed since that fight with you and and that was a good learning fight for him albeit on a loss um you took the decision home that night um but i feel like he used the fight with you to then go and make some changes in the way that he's you know gone on and i know he wants that rematch with you and mm -hmm. i'm sure you know because of how good the domestic scene is at cruiserweight that's a potential one for down the line. I know he's eyeing up Tommy McCarthy, who, of course, you've already beaten, which always is a good indicator of a very healthy competitive division that yeah. you've beaten him, he might go and beat him, and he might beat him, and and, and what have you. Yeah. Um, you mentioned his fight this past weekend against Vasil Dukar. Um, a very tough nut Yeah, it's to tough, crack. man. The guy was um, tough. He kept on coming forward. Taking that fight at short notice as he did, and, and getting in there, as you all know, sometimes you just have to get through those ones. Yeah, yeah. Um, is that a fight that you could see potentially happening again in the future, you and Chris Billum Smith? Yeah, why not? Why not? You know, if if it's at the right level, right platform, good money, everything can happen, man. Anything can happen. Why not? No. Get, get yourself. I smoke these guys. <laughs> Listen, you see with me, I just feel, I just feel sometimes, you know, these, I'm, I'm avoided, man. I'm avoided, you know, these, there's something going on, man. Because it's not, like, I, I don't get the fights that I need and, I, and that are good for me. But, it's like I don't know. I don't. I just don't know, honestly. Like I think it's it's one of them ones that, and people start to notice it now. People mm. are definitely starting to notice. I get a lot of messages asking, "Yeah, when you're gonna be out? What's what's going on?" You're like, kind of in that funky yeah. in between stage yeah. of your career where you've you've had some good domestic wins. You've mm -hmm. beaten Chris Billingsworth. You've beaten Tommy McCarthy. You've beaten Sam Hyde, Jack Massey. Um, Lawrence was ahead of you. And yeah. he's now obviously world champion. We'll speak about his result at the, the past weekend. And you're kind of at the stage now where you need that in-between fight. Yeah. Let's where start you, to... you bridge domestic and world, whether that's a European title fight. Obviously, you've boxed Tommy McCarthy before. Mm -hmm. If Tommy McCarthy fights Chris Billum-Smith and Chris Billum-Smith beats Tommy McCarthy or vice versa, that rematch with either one of them for the European title is always there. But you're kind yeah. of in that stage now where people look at it and go, okay, Richard react poor. Big puncher. What do I get for What do I get for fighting him? Well, not much. Maybe a, just a big punch. Minute. Yeah, so exactly. It makes sense. It makes sense. So people go, yeah, maybe not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then yeah, yeah. Sometimes it makes you, sense. It makes sense. You're in that kind of in between yeah. phase right now. And plus, it's like you know, okay, cool. Richard Rackpool. You know, we want to push him onto this, but Richard Rackpool wants this. But at the same time, Richard Rackpool beat the European champion. Mm. Mm. In, in great fashion and everybody else that are coming up to to that level mm. you know and so where to where to match and where who who's the ideal opponent and what do we do straight after that so just having you know the right people around me to just kind of graft that out and yeah. we go from there and it's not ideal i mean i know you've been out of the ring for a while now but a lot of fighters have been in a similar position because of covid, COVID a lot of yeah. people in that period of time have boxed once maybe if they're very very lucky twice yeah in that period of time you've not boxed since sort of december 2019 against jack massey what yeah. did you make of your performance there you got criticized for that as well the jack massey yeah. performance uh, a lot of holding in that fight yeah uh something that you've been working on in, in the off time i guess you, you would probably call it yeah of course you know and a lot of people don't know for that fight, I injured my hand pretty badly. You know, I was in the hospital for... we saw you the cast <laughs> when yeah, the last yeah, time yeah. I saw you. It yeah. Was, yeah, it was a terrible injury, but you know, no, you just have to get through however, however possible. And we got through that fight. You know, it's not something that I, I talk about a lot or brag about. You know, everybody has... And sometimes styles make fights mm. as well. You know, people could say I was holding people, but also he was leaning into me and holding at, at, at times. So... Just it was just one of those ones. It was uh, Styles make fights. It didn't bring fireworks to, to you know, to the um, the screens. So you know, it is what it is. You move on. It happens. Mm. That's as you say. Yeah. You know, the, you have good days at the office. You have bad yeah. days at the yeah. office. You're still 
very you know very inexperienced yeah. which is remarkable to say for somebody who's been british champion and you know stopped the european champion and yeah. you know you are still the early stages of your career you don't have any mar- you're 31 but you don't have miles on the clock i'm you, fresh you, exactly you're you, you're still fresh and a lot to develop yeah that's it <laughs> i'm not fresh so keep the camera off me no just fo- focus on him <laughs> <laughs> um but that being said so since that fight you you've you've switched trainers yeah uh, you're now working with angel fernandez that's it. I had eleven. I've had eleven fights. Mm. Compared compared to everybody else, man, I've probably had the least experience. Mm. Yeah. Talk to me about Angel Fernandez and the. Work yeah, he's a man. Him. He's a man. He's a, he's a wizard. I call him the wizard. He knows what he's what's very intelligent. You know, with his breakdown of different fires, different styles, he likes to integrate everything and mix everything together, and he's not scared to um, try new things. You know, try new things. If this works, it works. If it doesn't. Then we're gonna eliminate this mm. and try something else. So you need people like that, you know, just innovate. Things are changing. Boxing is way behind in, compar- in comparison to all these other sports, mm, my athletics. All of this. listen, if you see like it's on a different level. Like honestly, I speak to you, a lot of people. People going to the Olympics that are are um, predicted to to get golds, and they tell me about the the breakdown of what they do the system the teachers the coaches and everybody and how they work together the video analysis everything is so detailed and so precise when um I, I work I work with some close people now and they told me they they highlight this to me and they helped to, st- to structure things for me the way it is now and and help me professionalize my career and uh, I realized that there's so much more room for improvement, even though right now it's, it's great. Angel Fernandez is, is Spanish, but he's um, he's kind of a descendant of the Cuban style of boxing. I know yeah. he's done a lot of work with Jorge Rubio over the years, who, of yeah. course, kind of sort of like the it's passed down. You had like Salas to Rubio, yeah. Rubio to Fernandez, and I'm sure there'll be somebody who he kind of imparts his wisdom on, and they can kind of tweak and change and, and keep what they like from it and stuff. I know you've been out to Cuba a few times before. Yeah. Um, done some sparring and some training out there. Um, what's the the Cuban, the Latin feeling amongst you in the gym? I can imagine um, I've seen Angel drilling fighters and how he likes to work on drills and repetition. And it is still got that kind of Cuban fused style to it, really. Is that what you feel that you needed to add to your style? Because in in instances and in certain fights, you've that's been a label of you that you are you can be quite rigid. And in the Sam Hyde fight was was an indicator of that because of the nerves you were quite tense. And is that something mm-hmm. that you kind of eyed up as something that you needed to work on, which is why you ended up with Angel? To be honest, I don't I don't know. I just I was known Angel. Angel was in you know Loughborough. Um, and he had opportunity to head the boxing excellence, mm. um, center of excellence, and I thought this is perfect. Then this is perfect. We can link up. With, I've done work with with Angel before, and he's he's cool. He's down to earth. We connected straight away. Got a decent relationship, and he knows the game. He knows about you know the boxing styles. He knows what boxing needs, especially in the UK. You know, and what let's just say what could make it better. You know what can improve it, and I loved I loved the way he, um, you know, integrated you know the American styles, the styles, American styles, the Cuban styles, the Soviet type of styles, mm. uh, Mexican, and just try to mix everything together. You know, every fight is different, so we're gonna play off what you have, and then we're gonna try to add a little bit. We're not gonna change your whole style, mm. you know, but we're gonna try to add a few a few things in and and try to improve you as a whole. Whether it's more rhythm, more mobility, more movement, relaxation, whatever it is, you know, if it if it if it works, it works in the, you know, the results talk. It's just mm. that simple. So yeah, it's just it's been it's been great, and I've learned so much. I've learned so much about boxing. Even watching back my um, my sparring videos, yeah, I do look like like a Cuban. Like I look similar to a Cuban when I'm moving around. You know, you know, someone like uh, Savon. Simple, similar type of type of movement and stuff. Uh, I, know even you went, I, I know you went out there to spar him. Did you end up sparring him? Because I know you I went out there before, to. yeah, and you didn't. It didn't come off. Did I was supposed to. I was speaking to him on on Facebook and this trying to organize ago, it. Probably yeah. three years ago, around that yeah. sort of time, wasn't it? Yeah. I, was, I was speaking to him a lot, and we was planning, but the COVID came to 
Oh, was it? So yeah. that recently? Because I know that you'd, 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 I know you'd, you'd, you'd planned on going out there. Yeah, I was gonna go, yeah. but th- there was an issue because he had a camp because he had competitions coming up. Mm. So he was away in a different part of the of the of the city. So it was quite far away from me. And then, um, yeah, so it that didn't materialize. But we said we're gonna arrange something in the future. But I think now he's kind of packed it in. I think, mm. I think he's packed it in now. Mm. There's other people that have got the position. And yeah, it's it's hard in Cuba. You know, Every, everybody knows that. You know, it's, it's difficult there. I think number everybody has a standard wage, like getting like twenty or thirty pound a month or something like this. If you make it on the Olympic team, we're talking about you might get about one hundred and forty pound a month, and you get a house and a car, and that's it. Mm. And that's it. That's how you. That's how you live. It's difficult. It's a completely different world out there. Yeah. Um. Right, you were supposed to box this weekend on the Dillian White undercard. That hasn't come off. Yeah. Um, when can we expect to see you back in the ring? Because it's now, you know, coming on sort of 15 months or so since you've boxed, uh, December of 2019. When yeah. can we expect to see you back in the ring? I'm guessing the hand's all healed. You're all good. Yeah, everything, to go. everything's good. I'm ready to go. You're looking in great shape. Um, I'm ready to go, man. I'm I'm just being avoided, man. These these people are trying to work against me, man. You know what I'm saying? I just need to get back in there. Like now, <laughs> what like accent is that? This is a half Southern, half <laughs> Northern <laughs> American. <laughs> Mix with a bit of English. You think you need to work Cockney, on your accent? <laughs> a bit of pie and mash and liquor. <laughs> it's just a little mixture. But no, honestly, I'm trying to get out ASAP. ASAP. I'm, I'm, I've been training. I'm ready to, I just, I just can't wait to get in the ring, man. Honestly, I'm, I'm at that stage now, you know, and, and I spoke to Matchroom not too long ago and they said they're working on some, some dates and they're going to get back to me ASAP. So I'm waiting on some news from there and yeah, it's from the team and, and we'll go from there. That's well, it. while we're um, hovering around the subject of Dillian White, Alexander Povetkin too, mm-hmm. of course, the first fight was a great fight, which I think people, you know, not necessarily forgotten, but it was yeah. a brilliant fight through f- four and a half rounds. Yeah, that was a good um, fight. Obviously an emphatic ending in Alexander Povetkin's favour. You know Dillian extremely well, better than most people. Yeah. How do you think this weekend goes? I think Dillian knocks him up, to be honest. Uh, don't get me wrong, he's he's flipping dangerous as hell. When I see him, I saw him on Instagram the other day. I think Eddie Hearn posted up a video of him doing, like, hitting the mitts. And I thought, gosh, this guy looks so scary. He's, mm. He almost looks like a machine, you know? Somebody that doesn't really think because I don't, I've never heard him speak English or anything like that. It's just, he's just a wrecking ball. And yeah, you can tell he's he's very scored, even the, with that shot he threw at the end. It almost looks like it almost looked like um, Dillian wasn't even conscious of, of what was going on. You know, but watching that fight back, you can see he was dipping to the side, transferring his body weight here, fainting and then coming back and pulling back. And, you know, if obviously, if, if you don't know about um, that type of Soviet style, you're definitely not going to know what's going on. You know, it's just like the same as when they, when you throw your jab, they throw their right hand over your jab and throw and step in with a jab. You know, Kovalev does that a lot. It's like, <laughs> lean to the side. It's like, it will dishearten you to throw your jabs and mm. stuff. But that occasion, you know, it was just a mistake, a simple mistake, which I think you can rectify. He just needs to get that distance back again. It's just similar to what Mark said the other day on Sky. Just get the distance and no, can't can't let him get close. And if he, if he does get close, be very intelligent with the with the punches that you're throwing. Yeah, but I think and he's got a great show. You know, Dillian is like a ox. You know, when I spar him, I spar him more than times. He once he shows, there's not nothing's getting through. You're just gonna hurt your hands on his on his forearms because it's, it's like rock. Mm. And yeah, just just. Bust him up, bust him up with that jab. He'll probably want to quit, you know, after a while. Do you think um, not having Mark was a factor in the first fight? No. No, I don't think so. But maybe it could have been. Because the way Dylan is, you know, it's a thing where, in my opinion, I, I got on the phone to Dylan straight after and I told him that's the best I've seen you perform until that punch. Your balance was great. You were sharp. It was going back. It's just after a while, it's just you just switched off a little bit and you threw 
shots with him where he set you up with with a shot and landed and he said listen that's he just said listen that's heavyweight boxing it happens you know it's it's nothing i'm good i'm i'm good i'm i, I spoke to them i'm trying to get that that rematch asap and i remember initially it was made really like it was for too November. soon yeah I too agree. soon I and agree. a lot of people would agree people were saying listen that's not enough time for them for the brain to heal after a heavy knockout like that you know it could he could go in there concussed especially going back into heavy sparring as mm. he would yeah that's you know? what people don't really understand it's not yeah. necessarily even though the fight date was was very quick turnaround yeah it's how quick you've got to go back into camp how quick you've got, got, got exactly. to go and start sparring exactly you don't want to go into a fight against alexander povetkin without adequate sparring without you know with essentially just tech sparring and having yeah. a move around you need proper preparation you need proper preparation mm. and just you know that you're going to get softened up in the sparring as well mm. taking some heavy shots because you're definitely going to get some live sparring partners mm. isn't it when you're mm. preparing for somebody as dangerous as Povetkin so that's not that wasn't ideal and everybody was talking about that and I think that was the best thing that happened mm. was him catching COVID even though it wasn't obviously good for him and stuff but let's just say the the best thing that happened was the fight the getting delay, yeah, yeah for sure I agree, with COVID. That. I agree with that don't take yeah, we don't. Oh, I, I think so. he doesn't speak English anyway, so yeah. it doesn't matter. Privet, Privetkin. I like how you put the 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 Privetkin, the Povietkin, Povietkin, Bratan. What's that mean? Brother. Brother. Okay, oh, I like that. I have to ask um Uncle Al Siesta. Al Siesta. Al <laughs> mad Russian. Everybody knows about Mad Al. <laughs> Bloody mad as a hatter. Um, final word on Lawrence O'Coley. As I mentioned, yeah. um, British boxing has a new world champion. Yeah. Um. You were already very complimentary about him earlier. Yeah, well what a great performance great. From, from him Amazing. this past weekend. He did everything right. He kept he kept his distance. He he kept on moving. He had a good great game plan. Um shouts out to Shane McGuigan for that good game plan. He executed well. What what what, what you got to say? Everybody loves to criticize and talk about how things could be better or the opponent could have been better. Listen, they got the flipping job done. Done. End of you know, well done. He's somebody that you've spoken about in the past, wanting to face and, you know, seeing him. And, you know, you've come from similar-ish kinds of backgrounds, yeah. uh, both relatively inexperienced as amateurs, um, gone about things that, you know, you look at your record, the, the fighters that you've boxed, other than him, in my opinion, domestically, there isn't really a resume like yours, considering the amount of opponents yeah. that you've boxed who are all in the top 10 in Britain consecutively. Yeah. You've both, you and Lawrence, have gone about things at a fast pace. What kind of bonus and what kind of lift and benefit does that give you to see him go out there, execute, win the world title like that? Does that that must give you such a confidence boost and a lift to see somebody else of a similar kind of nature go and do something like that? Yeah, of course. You know, we have similar similar build from the um, same of the same heritage. You know, similar power. You know, it just shows if I I can get it right just like that, I can definitely do the exact same thing. You know, whether it's fighting a short opponent and getting making sure my distance is good and and, t and teeing him up for that for that big shot and ended it just you know what i mean and he came he came from the same it's true he came from the similar type of background um low experience and and achieved things that people thought that wasn't possible mm. you know they touted it. you know it's funny if we could take it back to 2000 and 2018 and it looked very different. People were like, "Who do you think are going to be the, the the world champions, um, or the next world champions of Britain?" And they'll have all pictures of us, and they'll be like, "Rekpo, no way." <laughs> or Coley. <laughs> yeah. There, there we go. There we go. Like other fighters, you see other prospects. They'll be like, "Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent, hundred percent." Take it back to twenty 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 one. Now, the whole conversation is different. Now, yeah. it's funny. Yeah. Now they're looking at they they're really looking at React Paul now and they're thinking, you know what? You know what? He can he can there's a possibility that he can actually go. I never thought like that he he would run through the fights that he ran through, let alone, you know, anything else and going for world title honors. But flipping out, that's that's pretty impressive. And then they find out how many fights I've had and they think, Whoa, you've had eleven fights. Like basically pretty much nearly half of your fights were like undefeated fighters and sol solid prospects mm. a lot of fighters in the uk if you check their resumes they haven't even had a 50 50 you know against like an undefeated fighter mm. 
letting on go and back forth and beating this much and then you were an underdog. You were under, you were, and you were the supposed underdogs. to lose to something McCarthy. Yeah, hundred percent. I was supposed to lose to most of them. And then got on checking Lawrence Okoli's um you know, his C V and then seeing him beating like Matty Askins and other fighters, you know, people will say, Yeah, that but but listen <laughs> It is what it is, isn't it? You know, it, he's gone through them. He's beat Golaraki. Golaraki only lost to Breedis and uh, Usyk. Yeah. But, he, you know, he was done. But, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's, it talks, he's done, he's done the work. You know what I mean? He's done the work. He, he got the job done. When you consider, you mentioned the Matty Askin fight there. Um, of course, another fight that you'll remember very, very vividly as to why was his fight with Isaac Chamberlain at the O2. Another terrible fight. Yeah. I've said this to Lars, we had him in here. You know, that fight, the Matty Askin fight, two fights that did more harm than good for his mm -hmm. career, really. Mm -hmm. um, but unrecognisable from that from that fighter who grabbed and held his way to a decision win in both of those fights, but yeah. particularly the Matty Askin fight, compared to kind of the clean and clinical version of him that we saw this past weekend. Yeah, it's completely different. Completely different. It just shows that you know, there's, you know, you can improve. You can improve if you put your head down and and have a good structure around you, good team, good trainers. You can do it. You can definitely do it. Hundred percent. I had him in the podcast a few weeks ago and asked him if he, if fighting in Nigeria was something that he wanted to do. Yeah. He said yes, of course. One day it is on the bucket list. How about you? Yeah, of course. I'd love to. But I think I don't know how it would go down, like the technicalities and stuff, mm. but. Listen, if we could do that, that would be amazing. I know Joshua will be on that. You know, I'm, uh, I see Joshua quite a bit. You know, sometimes I'm training in the Finchley gym and we talk a lot. And yeah, he he loves that stuff. He loves the idea of doing something. He actually said he wanted to do a fight in mm. in Africa. I think It'd that's how he picked up a bit of traffic. Mm. Um, Nigeria, why not? You know, there's a lot of fans down there. You know, that they there's big networks down there that mm. could really broadcast it's like, fights it's a it's not just boxing we see israel adesanya francis and yeah. um you know there's there's an awful lot of combat sports stars emerging from not just nigeria but, but africa all as a whole there, yeah. um, africa. i think it'd be huge for boxing that'd be massive fa jagba even fabio yeah. wardley as well another yeah. nigerian um basically all the best fighters on nigeria all yeah. the best fighters just put it out there there we go <laughs> yeah, just for the boxing and social fans, the best fighters are from Nigerian heritage. <laughs> Nigeria. <laughs> <laughs> we have you, you versus Akoli for the undisputed cruiserweight title, but you have to have a clash on the way to the ring. It's got to be in it. He's oh, got to come. Sick. He's got to come down with his bars, and you've got to come down with yours. That's the only yeah. way. That'll the be only sick. way it's going to happen. Yeah. That'll give that'll give everybody so much entertainment. People are like what? The oh, that'll be a lively crowd. About? That'd be a lively <laughs> crowd. Imagine that. Imagine like the colours and the green everywhere. Oh, yeah. it'd be good, wouldn't it? And then I'll make my own song come yeah. to the ring. Yeah. And he makes his own song. That'd be great. <laughs> Look. You know, that's one of the things I loved the other day. It's like, he actually made his own song. He made his own ring. song, came out to it. <laughs> well, it's he that's, to the... that's what it's all about. That's amazing, man. Trust me. That's what it's all about, man. Pumping your own music. and. Uh. He should have done like Andrew and Bruno got the mic. Yeah. And done. Well, if he'd done that, he I, would have gone viral. I think there was a little bit of um, discussion between some of the lyrics because of oh, some that of the was, lyrics and that Sky. Was being said. Yeah. Um, there's a really, it's quite an explicit song. Explicit. Explicit. They probably needed to do a clean version, but they've had to blank out the whole bloody song. So I, I'm yeah. not sure that would have worked. If you want to take the, if the if the girls are getting t taken to the Fippin higher. Yeah, the w. there we go. For the W. That's a W. <laughs> 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 but we want the W the other W <laughs> right I think we're probably about there Rich um, always a pleasure catching up with you I can't believe yeah. it's been so long yeah, since, we, long. since we've spoken um, but yeah it's, all, it's always a pleasure it's good to see you doing so well I hope you get yourself Thank a you very much. soon um, you should be very proud of yourself with where you've you. come from and what Thank you've you. achieved um, still a long way to go as you yeah, know yeah for sure um but yeah, thanks very much for popping on the Boxing Social Podcast, being so open and available with us. It's always a pleasure to catch up with you. And I hope to see you soon. Chocolato. Just want to give a shout out to everybody watching. Shouts out to the to the Palace fans. Hey, up the Palace go. all the time. Up the Palace. We're coming. <laughs> I'm telling you. Thanks very much, Rich. See you, man. Good, man. Well done. That was funny. We could have spoken for... That was good. good. <laughs> 